If you have your Bibles, we're going to look at a couple of scriptures today. Um, I'm going to give you the scriptures. I'll read some of them out to you. But I do want you to also study these out. Uh, we're going to go first to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29. And I want to talk about the plans that God has for you. And I'm assuming this is going to be kind of a part one, so I'm thinking there's probably going to be more uh, to go more in depth on this. So this is really just kind of a lay in the groundwork. But in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now we could take this apart, look at it. It's all good, of course. <clears throat> now, as he says there at the beginning, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. And if you look that word up, it's uh, actually number 4284 in the Old Testament in Strong's Concordance. And it's a word about that long, so I'll let you look it up. But because uh, I know my Texan won't do any, that Hebrew any good there. So. But the word actually means uh, an intention or a plan. It can even be used to mean a plot, like a, 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 a planned out, um, an entire plan from start to finish, put it that way. And it can also, it's translated in King James as a purpose or even as a thought, but it has to do mainly with some plans. In other words, this is not a one-time deal. This is an ongoing thing that God has. And he says that this ongoing plan that he has for you are thoughts not of evil, but of good. Amen. And it's to give you an expected end. In other words, you should know what the end is, and that expected, your end should be expected in the sense that you know that what God has for you is going to be good. But the main thing I want to get across today, there's three aspects of this, okay? Or as they do it in Europe, there's three aspects, okay? It says, let me give you, I'll read the rest of it on this verse, and we'll look at a couple of others. For I know the thoughts, the plans that I think toward you, or that I have for you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace. So underline thoughts of peace. Remember this word thoughts also means plans. So he has thoughts of peace. He has plans of peace and not of evil. And these things are to give you an expected end. So you could actually break this apart. Look at verse 12. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. And I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I've driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Now, notice, even in the middle of this, so what he's talking about, there is some sowing and reaping going on. He said, you've departed from me, you've gone into captivity, you've been scattered. He said, that was never my plan for you. He said, I know the plans for you, and, the, and what you're going through is not my plan for you. So that proves, first and foremost, <clears throat> that God's plans are not automatically always done. Do you get that? Yeah. And I can show you more scripture, and we will go through more. <clears throat> but 
even the scriptures that we know of, uh, just the things that we commonly talk about, you know, that God will take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it to good. Well, him turning it to good meant that the things that happened evil was not his plan and that they weren't from him. And, and the main thing there is, it's the enemy that plans the evil, but God plans good, and whatever he does, he turns to good. Right? You see that? Okay? <clears throat> now, but notice here, <clears throat> he says, the plans that I have for you, the things that I think towards you, thoughts of peace, not of evil. Now, notice he says, in, in the, why was he telling that? He said, because right now you're going through evil. You've got some things happening. He said, these aren't, these aren't from me. These are not my plans. My plans are good. My plans for you, and I'm going to show you some of the other things he says about his plans. But he says, if you will recognize that my plans are for you are good and that what you're going through, a lot of it has to do with some sowing and reaping, either individually, with Israel, even nationally. And he said, if, but in the middle of that, if you will recognize that my plans are good and you will pray and seek me, and kind of, we all know uh, Chronicles 7.14, of course, uh, you know, if my people call by my name, humble themselves, pray, and uh, basically repent from their evil doings, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land, right? And forgive their sins. So we know that what God's plan is, but here the nation of Israel had sinned and gone into captivity and scattered all over the world. Then he says, but if you will, he's, he's, so he's telling them here, and remember this, remember this, Jeremiah, this is Jeremiah 29, 11. Remember that. We're going to come back to this in a few minutes because it's it all tied together by the time we're done, and it's not going to take long. I promise. Okay. <clears throat> now, so let's look at the next plan of God. Right? I'm going to lay some things together, and we'll pull them all together. Third John two, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So, this being in Scripture in John speaking for God, he is basically giving prophetic word. He's showing the will of God, the mind of God. And we know that the plans of God are good, not evil. And the plans of God are for you to be in health and to prosper even as your soul prospers. See, a lot of people prosper beyond their soul prospering. And when they prosper beyond what their soul has prospered, their prosperity usually causes them to move into sin because their soul has not prospered to the degree that it can carry what, it, what you're supposed to do with that prosperity. One of the things about America is that we have worked and worked and we have tried to find ways to gain prosperity and work less, which means we have more free time to do something with the prosperity. And the fact that we prosper means that we have more free time. And the problem is many times when people have more free time and more prosperity, they don't use it rightly. And, and then they end up into sin. So, <clears throat> we know that part of God's plan is that we would prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. So, how is this supposed to happen? Well, we can go back and I can show you another aspect of it from Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. In other words, it'll always be in your mouth. You'll always be speaking it. There'll never be a time when you are to be silent concerning the word of God. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. Now, notice if you're meditating in the law of God, the word of God, day and night, you can't think about two things at the same time. If you're thinking about God's word, you're not thinking about sin. Real simple. All right? Then he says, that you may observe to do. Notice it's not enough to know it and talk about it you got to do it. And the reason you should know it and talk about it is so you can do it, right? So that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So again, now understand, if God didn't want them to be prosperous and to have good success, he wouldn't have told them how to do it. If them being prosperous and successful was against the will of God, then him telling them how to do it and guaranteeing that it would happen was actually tempting them or testing them or leading them into sin. Right? Do you, do you get that so far? Yes, sir. Right? Now, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. And, and I'm, you'd have to go back in and look verses before, verses after to get the full context here. Uh, but I'm just, uh, for sake of time, I'm just trying to go through some things with you. He says I, in verse 19... 
Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Amen. Now, guess what? If you choose life, you're also choosing blessing. Because right. he said, I'm, I'm setting before you life and blessing. Isn't that right? Death and cursing. So it's either or. It's not life and cursing. Right? It's life and blessing. Amen. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. Now, notice... Here's what we have to remember. See, this thing that has uh, really infiltrated into the church over years now, this idea that God has a secret will for every person. God does not have 8 billion plus wills. <laughs> you understand? He has one will. He doesn't even have three wills. I've heard people preach, you know, the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. So you're in, if you may not be in God's perfect will, but each time you're in his acceptable will. No, God's perfect will is good and acceptable. Amen. It's one will, right? And his will is that all would come to know Jesus Christ, right. right? And if you know Jesus Christ, therefore you're walking in the light as he is in the light, and therefore all of the blessings that are in that also come to you. God is not a respecter of persons. He does not have a different will for each person in this room. Amen. Now, see, the problem is we try to tie maybe our job with the will of God. Well, see, God's got the will for me, and his will for me is that I have this job at this place, and I live at this address, and I drive this kind of car, and God has not said any of that. He did not say that. God said, what do you want? He said, I want you. And if I get you, and your heart and your mind is toward me, then you can ask what you will. He said, if, you, if my words abide in you, and you abide in me, you can ask what you will. Why? Because he doesn't have to worry about what you're going to ask for. Right. That's right. If his words abide in you and you abide in him. So his will is the same for every person. He wants every person healed, healthy, whole, blessed, prosperous. Why? Because he wants you to share. He wants you to be generous. You can't be generous if you don't have anything to be generous with. Right. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm not talking about gathering it up and piling it up over here so you can have something and go, well, I've got this and you don't have that and I'm better than you because I got more. I'm not talking about that at all. And, and honestly, if you have prospered by God and your soul is prospered, you won't even think that way. You, you won't even think that way. Why? Because you abide in him and his words abide in you. See, God has this built-in safety mechanism. Right? And so he wants every person. He is not a respecter of persons. He wants every person to experience the full benefit of walking in him and with him. And the full benefit of walking in God, who is our life, is life in abundance. And life in abundance does not mean tubes coming out of your body or going into your body. It does not include pills going into your body. It doesn't include any of that stuff. Life includes you not needing that. And like we said in the first session, I'm not against medicine. If I needed it, I'd take it. I just don't need it, which is God's will. God's will is not that any person be dependent on a prescription for their life. Is that, amen? And that's not putting anybody down. That's not being negative. I'm saying, God, wherever you are right now, Maybe where you are, maybe you're at that place where you don't need medicine and you're healthy and you stay healthy and you live in divine health and that is where God wants every person and that's great. Now, if that's not you, that does not mean, oh, I'm not there, I'm just, I'm no good because I have to do that. No, no, he's just telling you, this is what I have for you. These are the plans I have for you. Go there, shoot for that, aim for that, head that direction. Amen, that makes sense? Yes. Not putting anybody down. Our heart goes out to the people that suffer and hurt and need things, of course. And we want every person to walk in divine health. That's one of the things that you know, has upset me about this current situation. is because they try to punish me for being healthy. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, and, and I get it. I mean, you know, bottom line, I, I don't understand, even like with the Walmarts now. And you all know I've been a promoter of Walmart for years. And honestly, I'm having to withdraw my endorsement. 
I don't even want to go there. Amen. Amen. And I don't go there any more than I absolutely have to. And I'm finding alternatives Amen. to not have to go there. Yeah. Right. Because I want them to know yeah. that me not being there costs them money. Yeah. And if they're going to try to take over my health control, right. Right. They, their business is not my health. Right. That's my business. That's right. yeah. Amen? It's just that simple. Now, now, personally, I know now they've got mandatory things in Walmart, and you've got to wear a mask and that kind of stuff if you go. To me, I think it would be a good business plan if they just said, because you've got Walmarts every couple of miles. Yeah. You know, just say, okay, this is a mandatory mask Walmart. If you need a mask or you want to be around people wearing mask, go to that one. This one over here is a mask optional. Oh, yeah. Why not do that? Yeah. And then see where people go. <laughs> is that not the simplest solution? Yeah. Why, why cannot the people in Bentonville, Arkansas figure that out? Why can't they figure that out and figure out, okay, here's what we do? Because, number, well, not even getting into the validity of the mask. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I really, I, I want inside. I really want to wear something that offends them. Right. I want I, I don't know what it would be. Zorro. But it would be yeah, Zorro. <laughs> I could do that. <laughs> that would be a good one. Yeah, actually. <laughs> so, good question. Good question. Yeah, yeah, there we go. You got to keep it, keep it, rein it in. Okay. So, so already we see that God's his plan for us is good. Amen? His plan is for us to prosper, to be blessed. I mean, come on. And then Jesus came, why? That we might have life and have it in abundance. Right? Not death, not sickness. Right? So people say, well, you know, God gave me this sickness and keep me humble. Uh, no, he wants you to have life in abundance. So he didn't give you death to get you into life in abundance. Amen? So, but here's the thing. There are three things I want to talk about specifically today. And this is really, really serious. And I, I remember whenever I was really praying about what to bring forward and how to bring it out, uh, I went back to Dr. Sumrall and some of the things that he taught and some of the things that I heard him say. And it, it helped me realize how important. I remember the first time I ever heard him say that he had been 50 years walking with God at that point. He said, 50 years, and I've never been out of the will of God. I mean, I was shocked. I mean, that, that just did not compute with me because I was raised Pentecostal. You know, if you weren't praying in tongues 24 hours a day, and if you weren't doing everything just right, you were out of the will of God, you know, and you're on shaky ground, meaning it could open up and swallow you and send you straight to hell any minute, <laughs> right? I mean, that was kind of the way it was. And here he said he'd never been out of the will of God in 50 years. And I thought, man, how do you do that? But it was because of the understanding that I had concerning the will of God. And thank God I was with them long enough to get that cleared up. Amen. And it's amazing because once I realized that, I got out of legalism and moved into the grace of God with discipline. Yeah. Right? See, grace has discipline. Yeah. If you don't have discipline with grace... Uh, you're probably not in grace. You're probably in licentiousness or living loose is what it comes down to because that's the way grace has been portrayed. So I want to talk about three things. Number one, we've already, we've already mentioned plans, so we're going to talk about three types of plans. Okay? The first one, first plan, which is aborted plans. The plans of God that get aborted. Right? The first example we have is right there at the beginning, Adam. God tells Adam, have dominion, subdue the earth. Did Adam, now, did Adam have dominion? Absolutely. Did he subdue the earth? No. He handed it over to Satan. That was an aborted plan. Here's something amazing. I started, when I started looking at this, you know, sometimes if you step back and you look at the pattern, certain things start to emerge and that really stand out. So that's this. You find Adam, Adam's life went from Genesis 2 to Genesis 5. That's it. Three chapters. 
his entire life was wrapped up and recorded in three chapters of the Bible. Now, so we want to talk just for a second about aborted plans. Can you abort God's plan for your life? Absolutely. And, and I can even show you why some people do. But I'm going to tell you a story that Dr. Summerall told us. He was telling us when he was talking about the will of God. He said he went to eat. He was a pastor there in South Bend, Indiana. And he went to eat with a very well-known, very wealthy businessman. The man had called him and said, the man didn't go to his church, didn't go to Dr. Summerall's church. And he said, can I meet with you? My wife and I would like to meet with you and take you out to dinner. And Summerall, he would do it, but he didn't really like that kind of stuff. And so he said, okay. So he goes and sits down, and they start talking, and the man is extremely successful. He is at the place where he is a multi-millionaire, maybe even above that at that point. And he, was, he, he had achieved everything he'd ever tried to achieve, everything he ever uh, wanted to achieve. His business was at a place where he could walk away from it and it would self-replicate and keep on going. And so he never had to worry about money. He didn't have any kids. He and his wife had no children. And he said, you know, he said, God has been dealing with me. He said, he called me when I was a child and I went into business and he prospered me. He said, I was faithful. I was faithful to church. I was faithful to tithe. I was faithful to give. He said, and I'm blessed. And so he goes through all of this stuff. And he said, but God called me when I was a kid. And he said, I didn't know how to fulfill it. He said, but he wanted me to, me to be a missionary. And he said, but I've never done that. He said, now I have supported hundreds of missionaries, but I've never been a missionary. And that was God's initial plan was for him to be that. He said, now God turned it, some of the things, and made it for good, you know, some of the things, because apparently, you know, the man did not fulfill the will of God in that sense. He said, but now I'm ready to step away. He said, I can go anywhere in the world. I don't need anybody to support me. I can support myself. I can even go places. I can build churches. I can build Bible schools. I can build all these. Uh, I can support missions. I mean, he was going on and on. And Dr. Moore went through this whole thing. The man is sitting there in a nice restaurant with his wife. They were, as I said, very wealthy. And they're sitting there with Dr. Summerall. And this man is going through. And he said, and I want to do this. He said, I need you to help me. He said, because... I, I want to know how to do this. How, how do I launch out? What do I need to do? And in the middle of this, Dr. Summerall said, okay, well, what do you do this? And they were talking. And the man's wife was sitting there quiet, wasn't saying anything. And then right in the middle of their conversation, she burst out in tears, took her napkin and threw it down on the table and said, I, no, I won't go. I'm not giving up my home. I'm not giving this up. I, will, I refuse to go and just caused a big scene right there in the restaurant. And the man just hung his head. And I, I don't know if he began, I, it seemed like a, Dr. Summerall said he began crying over the situation. And Dr. Summerall looked at him and he said, well, the first thing, you two got to get on the same page. He said, that's the first thing. He said, if you're not going to do that, it doesn't matter what you're going to do. And then Dr. Summerall Said, and so at that point, he said, I'll leave that with you. And he got up and left. He said, the man didn't become a missionary. He went along with the wife. And I believe he said within eight months, he was dead. Right after that, the wife lost everything. Everything. And she had no children, nobody to go, anything, and was literally Everything fell apart. She lost everything that was important to her. The man lost his life. Now, we're talking about aborted plans. Now, that wasn't God. God didn't kill that man. Right? But he had gotten into a place of disobedience. And he'd gotten into a place where he let somebody else decide whether he was going to follow God or not. Because when you stand before God, you're going to stand there alone. I mean, they, your spouse may be close, but you're going to answer for yourself. Bottom line. So that was an aborted plan that God had. Imagine what they could have done, you know, with, with the way things work, okay? Here's the point. Whatever you compromise to keep, you will lose. And we can talk about the individual plan of God in our life. We can talk about situations as they are right now. You know, I'm sure you've seen the thing on Facebook that's gone around. It's just a mask. 
It's, right. it's just for this. It's just that, just for a little while. It's just for this. See, and whatever you compromise principles to keep, mm -hmm. you will lose. That's right. Because compromise in itself is weakness that causes the loss. Do you get that? Okay. Now, as I said, Adam's whole life, three chapters. Okay. Let's go to the second one. So the first one was aborted plans. Second plan. And this is a partial abortion of a plan, you might say. Okay. A plan that is partially aborted. Partially succeeded, but partially aborted. And this is actually where most people fall into line. Most people don't outright, I say most, many don't outright just walk away from God or abort the plan of God. Most people fall under this category. And that is this, and we'll see this in uh, the life of Samson. When you look at Samson's life, you see a partially aborted plan for his life. Now, you could also see it in the life of Jonah. But Jonah was able to, you know, repent, turn around, and pick back up, even though he didn't want to. Right? But now notice, you find Samson's life, his entire life, between the, in Judges, between the chapters 13 and 16. Three chapters. <clears throat> His whole life in three chapters. In Judges 16, 23, he starts and he says, Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God and to rejoice. Now this is the situation. Samson, uh, and we'll talk about how in just a minute, but this had come to the point where they had finally captured him. His enemies had captured him. They cut his hair, which allowed them to overcome him. And then they put out his eyes. And they put him in prison. And when a certain day came, then they said, bring him out. Let's have sport with him. Let's, let's see what, who our god Dagon has delivered into our hands, you know, our, our great enemy. And now notice, it says, our god hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their god. So we know that this was not God's plan for Samson, that he would be the, the opportunity for someone to praise another God. Right? So for somebody to go, well, that was all in God's plan. N no. It's never in God's plan for one of his people to give cause for other people to praise another God. For they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. Now, it doesn't say what, because it said he made them sport. So apparently they laughed at him. They, had, you know, they were making fun of him, whatever. And it, that apparently went on for a little while, but then they put him between the pillars. So something had already happened. But during this time, while he was in prison, his hair grew back. Then he says, they called from out of the prison. He made them sport and set him between the pillars. Verse 26, and Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand. Notice, here's this great warrior being led by a child, a lad. Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house stands that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me. What was he doing? He was repenting. He was turning around. I pray thee and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. And that's called God turning something that was meant for bad to good for his purpose. I mean, right? Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down, took him and brought him up and buried him 
between Zorah and Eshtal, which is where he spent a lot of his time, if you look at it, in the burying place of Manoah, his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. 20 years. Now, if you do an estimation of this, that means that he was approximately about 40 years old when he died, approximately. So, now if he died at 40, and we know that this was not God's plan, because he should have lived at least another 40 years, to at least 80. Some would even say 120, and you, you don't see many people doing that after, by this time. But let's just say another 40. So if he, and he judged Israel 20 years, if he had lived another 40 years, he would have judged Israel 60 years. And Israel would have been safe because as long as he was judging Israel, Israel was safe. So it was, now see, here's where you have to figure out. God's plan for Samson was not so personal that it did not affect the nation. See, his plan for Samson was not that he die this way and that this take place because that left the nation of Israel in the Philistines' hands. See, this is what, this is one of the things that, that uh, kind of gets me when it comes to Christianity is because honestly, most Christians, they go to church, they hear what they're told and they don't think about it. And they don't think rationally, they don't investigate, they, they don't analyze, and yet the Bible says to meditate therein day and night. Mm -hmm. this, you're not supposed to just be lemmings yeah. that just blindly listen to anything somebody says. And not even me, I, I tell you all the time, don't just take my word for it. Now, I, I do everything I can to be accurate and, and to deliver what God tells me to give, but it's still up to you to search it out. Because the only gold that's yours is the gold you mine. Yeah. You understand? See, I can, I can read this and I get faith. But you don't get faith just by hearing it. Right. Faith comes. It's at the door. It's waiting for you to pick it up. Right. And if you will hear it and analyze it and look at it and go, yes, I can believe it. Now faith is part of you. Man, that's right. See? But you have to get that for yourself. I can't give you faith. I can give you the word. Man. But faith is the word plus action. That's just the way it is. No action, no faith, basically. There has to be some type of, and I'm not talking about just physical action. I'm talking about even a mental action of going in and going, yeah, that's true, right? Not just agreeing, but knowing that it's true. Now notice, I want to give you a couple of things here. First off, he got his hair cut, which was a violation of his covenant. When he got his hair cut, he lost his power. His eyes got put out. He was a prisoner of God's enemies. None of those things were God's will. Right? But, amazingly, his hair grew back. And when he got his hair back, God, being a God of covenant, kept his covenant, and the power came back. Yeah, come on. Amen? So even though he messed up, God still honored it, even in the midst of his mess up. Even while he was in captivity, God honored his word and honestly, if, I mean, God delivered him, even through death. Amen? Amen? Because there are things worse than death. Yeah. One of which is to be a prisoner of your enemy for a period of time, any period of time. Amen? Yes, with whatever would come with that. <clears throat> so, now get this. He killed more in his death than in his life. That's pretty amazing. He's still listed in Hebrews 11 as a person of faith, a person that we're supposed to follow his faith, not necessarily his actions or even his life, but his faith. So the lesson to be learned, one lesson to be learned through Samson's life is this. Sin leaves scars. Why? He got his hair back, got his power back, never got his eyesight. It leaves scars. So even though God can turn something, even though, now get this, even with the scars of sin in Samson's life, he still killed more in his death than he did in his whole life. So God can even do more with the scars than you had done before. But, get this, if you didn't have the scars of sin, how much more could God do? Right. That's right. That's right. See, we don't want to minimize Sin. 
well, God can do more. You know, even if I'm in sin or even if I've committed sin, God can still do more with me. And it'd be good. yeah, that's true. And God is amazing. He's faithful. Absolutely. But don't ever discount sin and go into sin thinking God can still use you anyway. Right. That's the point, right? Avoid the sin. And you'll see what God can do with a person that avoided the sin, not just what he can do in spite of the sin. Amen? So, now watch this. We know, and I'm, I'm still, we're not going to look at Scripture necessarily, but David, I mean, amazing man of faith, man after God's own heart, God said, and yet we look at his life, and he had sin in his life that was pretty blatant. You know, I mean, even when he was king, after being king and after God doing all he did to make him king and after Goliath and all that stuff, he still had Bathsheba. He became a conspirator to commit murder, had the murder committed, became a liar, all of that just to get Bathsheba. Right? So now, watch this though. Even with all that, David's lineage was promised the throne of Israel forever. God said, you will always have, as long as there is a throne, if there's a throne of Israel, your lineage will sit upon it. Isn't that right? Yep. That's pretty good, especially even with David's mess up. But now notice what else came. He said, the sword will never leave your house. You'll always be in power, but you're always going to have trouble. And you're always going to have the sword in your own home. In other words, you're going to have treachery. You're going to have treason in your own home. What did David go through? He had a son that tried to overthrow him, that he had to go to war against. Then he lost his son. So here's a man that loses his son. His son dies. Even if the son was trying to overthrow you, that rips your heart out. And yet that's what was going on that whole time. And even in his own family, one of his own sons raped one of his own, one of David's daughters. So that was always going on. Why? Because of Bathsheba. One sin, essentially. David even had a child die. I mean, death was in his home. As much as the amazing things and as much as we can learn from him about how to serve God and how to love God, we can also learn by how much he messed up. And yet, God didn't take that and go, well, you know, I'm done with you. Isn't that amazing? Well, that ought to give us hope. Amen? Yeah. Now, and why did all that happen? Was it because of he killed Goliath? No, and because he killed? It's because of Bathsheba. So that was a, also a partial aborted plan of God. Now, as I said, Adam, his entire life, three chapters. Here you've got Samson, his entire life, Judges 13 to 16. Three chapters. Amazing pattern. But now let's look at the last type of plan, and that's a plan accomplished. That's the plan we want. We don't want an aborted plan. We don't want a partially aborted and partially accomplished plan. We want a plan of God that's accomplished in our life. Amen? Yes. We, want, we want the Paul kind of plan. Yes. I've run the course. I've finished my race. Isn't that right? And I'm not going to talk about him right now because most of you know a lot about his life already and we probably will in the future. Uh, but look what he went through. And he said, I have finished my course. In other words, you laid out a course and I'm running on it. But look at what he went through. Just because he was in God's plan didn't mean everything was fine. Didn't mean everything was great. Didn't mean that he didn't have any problems. He actually went through a list of his problems. Right? Shipwreck, beaten, stoned, left for dead. I mean, come on. You know, he got bit by a snake. It didn't hurt him, but who still, who wants to be bit? You know, nobody wants to get bit, right? I mean, come on. He goes through all this stuff. He, he said he was in perils of brethren and of false brethren. Right. Think about that. The people that he trusted most stabbed him in the back. So just because he was following God didn't mean everything was perfect. Right. And yet for some reason, especially, uh, you know, in the faith movement, if something's going on, what'd you do? What'd you do to deserve that? Why'd you do that? I mean, and that's people look at, oh, well, look, they're, they're sick. Well, what'd they do? No, so, listen, you can't judge whether somebody is walking, not walking with God based on what they're going through. 
when, especially when you've got people like Job and Paul and right. even Jesus. And you, can't, you can also not base whether a person is walking with God or not walking with God based on whether they're prospering and whether they're doing good. So you can't base it on that. You have to look for character. You have to look for the person and what they do. If a person's uh, going through something and loses everything, okay? It's not the losing everything. What'd you do to lose everything? No, no, that's not what's important. What do you do when you lose everything? How do you react when you lose everything? That's what counts. That's what shows character. Or you're prosperous and you're blessed. What do you do? How do you deal with prosperity? David quoted something pretty good. He said, Lord, don't make me so poor that I might be tempted to steal. And don't make me so rich that I might be tempted to forget you. That's a good balance. David was pretty wealthy. And yet he's tried to stay focused with God. He, he went off here. He went off there a little bit. But he seemed to come back to center. One of the things that the, 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 one of the secrets, and Dr. Summerall used to teach us uh, the principles of the, uh, what, what I call the principles of the patriarch. It's not what he called it. But he talked about the Abraham principle. But it, when he talked about David, he said, David, the principle that made David what he was was that he had the, he had the ability to quickly repent. Yes. Quickly repent. He, he didn't let something fester. If he messed up, he hit his knees and, and apparently meant it. I mean, you know, I'm not talking about just lip service. So, a plan accomplished. You can find this in Genesis, starting in Genesis chapter 20. I'm sorry, chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30, verse 24. And it's about this person. And she called his name Joseph. Joseph was a plan accomplished. But look at his life. That man went through it. Amen? And yet remained faithful. Remained faithful to God. I mean, we're going to look at it real quick here. But notice it said, And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. Now notice this. The first reference you get of Joseph's life in Genesis chapter 30, verse 24. The last reference, which says this, So Joseph died, being 110 years old. And they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. This is in Genesis chapter 50, verse 26. 20, now notice this, 20 chapters of the Bible, of Genesis, is dedicated to Joseph's life. Three to Adam, three to Samson, 20 to Joseph. And does that, does that not point us in the direction and say, maybe that's a life we should study. Maybe that's a life of faith that we can go in and look because every type of situation, I mean, you could almost say about Joseph, probably could say that, I haven't examined it, but you could probably say about Joseph the same thing they said about Jesus. In every wise, in every manner, tempted like as we, but yet without sin. He's, he, he went through these tests, these trials. His life was full of tests and trials. And it's amazing what he went through and suffered and yet was able to remain faithful towards God. So in Genesis, uh, well, 20 chapters, like I said, his name is mentioned 228 times in Scripture. 228 times in the Bible. In Hebrews 11.22, it says, By faith, Joseph, when he died made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. But when he died, they were all still in bondage in Israel. And he made a prophetic statement saying that whenever you go into the promised land, take my bones with you and bury me in the promised land that God promised Abraham. Yeah. And he's known as a prophet. And that's exactly what happened. They carried his bones with them into the promised land and he was buried there. Think about that. That was fulfilled after his death. Now, <clears throat> we can look, just to give you highlights, I would say. We actually have a book in the uh, bookstore in there about Joseph that was written by Dr. Sumrall. God gave Joseph dreams. They all came true. 
They also brought hardship. They brought trials. They brought sacrifice. He was tested over and over, and he passed. He was tested by being put into the pit by his own brethren, and he passed. He was tested by being put into prison unjustly, didn't, did nothing wrong, but was put into prison, and he passed the test. He was faithful under pressure. He was tested by Potiphar's wife, and he passed. Amen? Amen? I mean, when you read what David said, and he said, and what Timothy wrote, when, he, when Paul, well, what Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, flee youthful lust. That's what Joseph did. And Potiphar's wife tried to get him to sleep with her and even grabbed a hold of his coat and he literally came out of the coat and left. That's right. Which unfortunately gave her the evidence she needed <laughs> you know, to quote unquote file charges on him and make him look bad. But then he went to prison. But again, even though he was tested by Potiphar's wife, he passed the test of loyalty to his master and to God at the same time. That, see, that is amazing. All that he'd been through. What that means is that the whole time, all this stuff of the pit, all the problems, different things like this, all of that means that he did not harbor any bitterness because you can't be a bitter person and flee youthful lust. It would be, it'd just be part of, well, you know, finally getting a break. I mean, come on, if I, if I sleep with the boss's wife, maybe she can put in a good word for me. Maybe I'll be okay. Maybe, you know, I've got to protect her in the palace. See, that's how people think. He wasn't thinking that. He was thinking, I'm leaving here. He didn't realize the trouble she could cause him. Or maybe he did. You know, I don't know if he thought it out or had anything else, but whatever it was, he had to know that she could cause him some trouble. So, he was tested in the fire of revenge when his brothers came before him later. Remember whenever he was put in a position of authority? They came before him. He could have said, hey, Recognize me? Remember the guy you put in the pit? Remember the guy you sold as a slave? Yeah, well, how do you like me now? <laughs> See, he could have said that. But he didn't fall to revenge. Amen? Instead, he had the heart of God and was able to say, you know what? What you meant for evil, God has turned to good. As a matter of fact, it's even going to help you. Because God told him to have the wisdom of the famine that was coming and to gather the wheat and do all these things. And he, and he just kept getting blessed and blessed and blessed. And here's a slave that goes from a pit to being a slave to going to prison. And now he's at the right hand of Pharaoh, the highest person in Pharaoh. Think about that. Just because he was faithful. He didn't maneuver himself. God maneuvered him. So... He showed character and wisdom, and he rose to the top. And remember, Adam, three chapters. Samson, three chapters. Joseph, 20 chapters of his life. So the question comes down to how many chapters in the book of life will be devoted to your life? Are you going to get three chapters? Are you going to get 20? Because it all comes down to how faithful you are, how faithful you stand how you let the character of Christ come out through you under pressure. Because, you know, it's an old cliche, but we all know that uh, diamonds are produced under pressure. So, now, with Adam, he had dominion over the whole earth. Samson had miraculous strength, power, by faith in his covenant with God to defeat every enemy except himself. He was his biggest problem, as most of us are. Joseph, no mention of any miraculous powers. Just the wisdom of God. Just the character of God. Got 20 chapters. The others, power, miraculous feats, killing all his enemies, three chapters. Might show us where God puts emphasis in what he puts weight into. Amen? Amen? So, real quick now, very quickly, yep. 
we're going to look at the consequences of not fulfilling God's will or plan for your life. Number one consequence. Now, these are just a couple of them. I, I wouldn't say they're all. Number one, not fulfilling God's will or plan for your life. Some will just fall away completely. They just fall away just completely. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Meaning you can depart from God. And he's talking to brothers. He's talking to Christians. And said, you can. If you have an evil heart of unbelief, you can depart from the living God. Verse 13. But instead, exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So what does that mean? When you're not fulfilling God's will, you will be in sin. And the deceitfulness of sin can cause you to have an evil heart of unbelief. And the more sin you walk in, the further you get from God, and the less faith means anything to you. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. That was number one. Some will fall away. Number two, some, which is just as bad. Remember, all of these are bad. This is not levels, I would say, but just remember they're all bad. Number two, some will become lukewarm. Revelation 3.15, I know thy works, that you are neither cold nor hot. In other words, you haven't fallen away completely. I would that were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. That's pretty strong. Just by being lukewarm. I would add to that and even just to say, uh, if you've ever been more on fire for God than you are today, you're backslid. Pretty simple. Boy, you are quiet. <laughs> That's pretty simple, though, isn't it? I mean, I mean, is that not right? Yeah. If you've ever been more on fire for God than you are today, then you've, you're backslid. Yeah, that's right. So, number three. Some will allow sin to become common in their life. They start to condone it. They start to put up with it. They start to baby it, we would say. Hebrews 3.13 it says, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin just needs a little open door. And a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And it gets to where that's called, like I was talking about earlier, that's where you become lax. Well, it's just this. Right. It's just that. Right. What, right. You know, yeah... There's some nudity, but it's, you know, just real quick in, in that show. It's not, it's, not, it's not a lot. Well, there's, you know, I mean, well, yeah, they do take the Lord's name in vain. But, it's, you know, it's not that bad. It's not that often. Well, yeah, there's some heavy language, but I don't talk that way. <laughs> no, the Bible says if you enjoy. In other words, if, you, if people are sinning, and you enjoy their sin. You're just as guilty as they are. That's why David said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. And yet, hey, it's just a little TV. I'm just relaxing. I need, I need something to disengage. Well, I know it shouldn't be that, but, you know, I mean, come on. You know, if I could get a version that didn't have it, I would do it, but it's just not out there. Nowadays, it's in every movie. Nowadays, this alternate lifestyle is in every show. It's in every movie. If I, if I make a principle and, and if I make a stand there, I won't be able to watch anything. Well, well. <laughs> Might have time to read your Bible. I don't know. I mean, just saying, you have to decide how far because the enemy doesn't care. See, the enemy doesn't have to get you hot or cold. He's just got to get you lukewarm. Right? Uh -huh. So, and number four, in some, it'll show in their emotions. Some, if you're not fulfilling the will of God, here's what'll happen. 
you'll start to get depression, you'll start to get anger, and you'll start to get fear. Why? Because the depression is because you know you're not doing God's will. And you know you should. And if you have the Spirit of Christ in you, then that grieves the Spirit of God in you, which results in, the, in depression in your emotions. And you start to get depressed because you know what you should be doing. Right? right? And then the next thing that comes is anger. Why? Because now you're mad at yourself. And when you're mad at yourself for not doing it, you get mad at everybody else. And you project on them. And amazingly, half the time, then you start pointing a finger at them. Well, look at what they're doing. Look, they're not doing anything. And then you start becoming legalistic. Why? Because you don't want to turn that back on yourself. Because the spotlight's already on you. So you start getting mad at yourself, and then you have bitterness, and you start getting all this stuff, and then all kinds of, and when you start feeling that way, it causes all kinds of things to happen in your body. Because your body responds to your emotions. And lets all kinds of negative things start to happen, and even causes sickness and illness and all kinds of stuff. And then you want to blame it on the devil. It ain't the devil's fault that you're not following God's will. It's your choice. And all that other stuff came from that. So, and then fear. When you're not fulfilling the will of God or the plan of God, I guarantee you, you will walk in fear. Because you're either going to walk in faith or fear. One of the two. And if you're not fulfilling the will of God, you're not going to walk in faith. And when you don't walk in faith, you will walk in fear. When you walk in faith, you know nothing can hurt you, nothing can touch you. You know that you can drink any deadly thing and it won't hurt you. You can, you want, because that's what faith, that's how faith thinks. It's how it lives. And when you know you're not walking with God, then the opposite of that is true. Everything can hurt you. This will hurt you. That will hurt you. This is going to happen. All that. Oh, when you're walking in faith, oh, God's got my back. No matter what, when the dust settles, I'll still be standing. When you're not walking with God, fear sets in. I don't care if everything's good. It's going to get bad. Why? Because fear. Because you don't fulfill the will of God. So, 1 Samuel 16. Now, I, I, I really I, I hesitate bringing this up just because it can open up questions that I don't have time today to fulfill. But I'll try to give a real quick summary to help. Um, so, in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, <clears throat> Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him, anointed him, David, in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now, see, that's the part that people... So an evil spirit from the Lord? No, no, you have to understand. God sets things in motion, and you either walk here or walk there. See, if you walk in the blessings of God, then God doesn't have to make the blessings come. You're walking in the path that is blessed. If you don't walk in the path that's blessed, you're walking in the path that's cursed. God doesn't have to bring the curses. You're walking in a cursed path. You understand? So when it says an evil spirit from the Lord, he's not saying that God uh, said, evil spirit, go to the him. And, no, God, that's not what God does. But Saul's uh, position, Saul's actions, automatically would, that sowing of those actions would cause the reaping of this evil spirit coming to him. Uh, you know, in the, in the secular world, or whatever you want to call it, they even call it the law of attraction, that you attract whatever spirit you're of, right. right? And so that's what happened. God was not doing it. Now, understand, God put the law of sowing and reaping in motion, so God takes a responsibility for it, even though he didn't have to personally say, go do this, right? So he takes uh, responsibility for it, but we know that he wasn't directing this, right? So that's as far as I can get right now. We'll, we'll look at that more later. But he says, and Saul's servants, verse 15, <clears throat> said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubles thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. So in other words, we, we, now what is he saying? He was getting, Saul was getting depressed. He was getting a, a bad spirit, so to speak. In other words, he was getting negative. He was getting depressed. He was getting down. And they said, Listen, let us find a person who can play the harp that whenever this thing comes on you, he'll play the harp and it'll cause you to be lightened in your spirit and you won't be bothered. In other words, you'll come out of this depression. Essentially, that's what's going on. Then he said, And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Now you know also that at one point, David's there playing and yet 
Saul still is angry against him and even takes a spear and throws it at him to try to kill him. Again, why? Because what is going on? Saul was, he was depressed, he had anger, and he had fear. That's right. That's right. He was depressed because he wasn't doing what God called him to do. He had anger because he was mad at himself for not doing what God called him. And he had fear that David was going to take his throne. Yes, sir. That's right. See, these are the evidences of the fact that you're not walking with God. <clears throat> now, last part. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, or Darius, but that's not even the way to say it. It's a long name, Doriosheth or something like that. Better look it up. Anyway, in the first, to us, it's Darius. Today, he's Darius, okay? So, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahusuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books. You hear that? He didn't even say, the word of the Lord came to me. He didn't say the wisdom of God. He said, I understood by books. Another translation says, by the reading of books, I understood. So here Daniel said, I got a hold of some books, and I started studying these books, and by studying these books, I came to this conclusion, right? And watch this. He said, understood by books, the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Now we know which book he was reading. He was reading the book of Jeremiah. And by reading the book, he understood that the number of years that God told Jeremiah that Israel was going to go into bondage had been fulfilled. Now notice what he says, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Now notice, he's, he goes to Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, he's reading it. He says, God showed me that God said to Jeremiah, 70 years, Jerusalem is going to be in desolation. I figured out this is the 70th year. So now I set myself to start to pray, seek God, begin fasting. Now notice, he didn't just say, oh, look, the time's up. Glory to God. Let's all go back to Jerusalem. No, he had to do something to bring about the prophecy that God gave Jeremiah. And that prophecy, what got them into bondage? They had strayed from God. Daniel actually talks about it. You can read the rest of this. So Daniel turns around and says, listen, I'm the prophet of God. So I represent God to the people. I represent the people to God. Therefore, I repent and turn this thing around. And now we go back. And so he's undoing what the people had done and turned back to God. Now, Daniel had never walked away from God. He'd been with God the whole time. But now he saw, okay, so the people had done this. This is what happened. 70 years is up. Let's do this. And he, he did something to cause the change. Now, and he went through the whole thing <clears throat> uh, and talks about it. But now, go with me back. Where do we start? Jeremiah 29, 11, right? So go back to Jeremiah 29. But instead of verse 11, go to verse 10. Remember, 11 talks about the plans that God has. But look at verse 10. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. That's what Daniel was reading when he understood by reading books that it was time. And he said he had to believe that God was going to keep his word and bring them out of bondage and bring them back into freedom. He was talking, to, he, he did the same thing Moses did. He brought a people out of bondage back to Jerusalem by setting himself to change something. Now, maybe not to the same degree that Moses did it. But then, see, this is where he said, this is all part of that prophecy that God gave. For thus saith the Lord, after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you, perform my good word towards you, and in, ca and in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts, the plans that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Now think about that. He was saying that to Jeremiah while, Jeremiah, while they were in bondage. He said, listen, this, this thing, it's not my plan. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken to you. How did Daniel know what it would take 
to turn things around. He read Jeremiah. He said, when the 70 years are up, you're going to call upon me, and I will turn things around. So Daniel said, wow, 70 years is up, so all we got to do is pray. Turn to God. He'll deliver us. He had to believe that. By faith, Daniel believed and brought them out of bondage. So again, a mission accomplished, if you want to say that. A plan accomplished. Amen? The whole purpose of today, the reason I want to bring this out is because I want you to realize you're in charge of your destiny in the sense that you are the only person that can determine whether you are going to accomplish God's plans that he has for you. Nobody else. Listen, the economy doesn't dictate it. God doesn't alter his plans based on the economy of a nation. Right? Look at, look at Joseph. The economy of the nation went down. Joseph prospered because of the wisdom of God. Let me tell you, if there was ever a time, I'm not telling you to do this. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you, if there was ever a time to invest, this is that time. Why? Because things are going to get better. They may not ever technically be exactly the way they were before, but they're still going to get better. Why? Because God is for us. He's with us. So the whole point is that we get to decide whether we trust God or not. The woman that fed the prophet. Remember, the prophet goes to her and says, uh, listen, feed me something. She said, I've just got enough for me and my son. We ain't got enough for you too. He said, no, make mine first. You'll be blessed. Now think about that. She gave in, went along with it, and she was blessed. Isn't that right? And if she'd have had more buckets, she'd have been more blessed. She limited the blessing of God by how many buckets she went and found. So imagine that. Now, if that happened today, it'd be on every major news thing. Preacher takes woman's last meal. <laughs> and it would be all over how bad, and they'd be talking about it for weeks, how bad this preacher was, you know, taking the food out of this little widow woman's mouth. And they would, and true to form, they wouldn't even mention about the buckets of oil that she had and how, how she prospered after doing it. Amen. But now notice, that was a time of famine. Everything was gone. And yet, the woman obeyed the word of the Lord. And she prospered. So God doesn't go by the economy. He doesn't go by who's in office. He doesn't go by who's heading up Congress or anything else. He, goes, he has his plan, and our job is to get in line with his plan and keep walking and stay faithful and be a voice and not to abdicate our position of authority and dominion in this earth. Amen? Amen. Amen. So rejoice, be excited, yeah. and know Woo. that you're in charge of what you're going to be experiencing. And if where you're at, if God can't use where you're at to bless you, he'll move you yeah. and get you in a place where you can receive yeah. all of his blessing. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Amen. Did y'all get anything out of this? Amen. Amen. So we want mission accomplished. We want plans accomplished. We don't want plans aborted. We don't want plans partially accomplished. We want to be able to say with Paul, I've finished my course. I've run my race. Amen? Yes. Doesn't mean everything's always going to be fun and games, but the bottom line is when the dust settles, we'll be standing. Yes. Amen? Yes. All right. My team will help. If you need ministry, we'll be glad to minister to you, and they will organize that, and I will be right back to minister to you. Other than that, we bless you. I say in the name of Jesus, we bless those watching. Father, we thank you. Your word is true. Yes. We thank you, Father, those listening and watching, those that are here. They're right now in the name of Jesus. Sickness and disease, you have no right in their body. You have no right in their minds, no right in, their, in the chemistry of their body, no right in any system. And we command you in Jesus' name to let them go. Leave them. Remove yourself from them and do not return. We set them free in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Be made whole. Head to toe in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, if you can receive that, you can receive your healing right where you are. Uh, if you still want me to lay hands on you, I'd be glad to do that. I'm just telling you, you don't have to have me lay hands on you to receive. God's word is true. So you can, you can decide to receive right where you are and walk out of here free. Amen? Amen. And then you'll give the glory to him, and that's what I really want.
So, all right, God bless you. Hey guys, hey, I just wanted to welcome you. I'm Curry Blake, uh, General Overseer of John G. Lake Ministries. We are so glad that you have decided to take the step to investigate life teams, becoming a certified divine healing technician, getting plugged in and taking the responsibility to enter into the life that Jesus has actually died to give us. So the next step now, since you've come this far, is to simply sign up. That's how to get started, just sign up. And when you do, now you're gonna go and check your email box and you're gonna get instructions on how to become certified DHT, how to start a life team. Uh, but you know, and, and maybe some of you are already within JGLM and you're already a leader at some level and you're saying, okay, why do I have to do this? Well, it's very simple. We're putting everybody into the same system so that it works like a well-oiled machine, like we've talked about, because we want to make sure everything is working very well together. So uh, if you are an existing leader within JGLM, we can tell you nothing's gonna change. We're just gathering the information so it's all in one database and we are gonna be able to communicate with you a lot better. This is, this is going to really solve the communication problems that uh, we've, we've had over the past. But this is a new day and you get to get right into it. So sign up, do it now, don't wait, do it now, and then check your email box. It's just that simple. So listen, I really appreciate this. Jesus appreciates this because you're plugging in and you're wanting to take responsibility. So I look forward to working with you. We're gonna have a great time advancing the kingdom. God bless you. We would like to thank our partners and friends for making today's broadcast possible. If you enjoyed today's message or would like more information and resources, please visit our website at jglm.org. Rise up and heal the earth. Rise up and be the light. Rise up and fight the fight. Come on and rise. We've got to rise. If you are considering partnering with us and would like to support our mission, please visit jglm.org forward slash partners. Proceeds will go toward the cost of the television broadcast and our mission work around the world. Visit jglmmedia.com to watch this program and more at any time. Subscribe for full access to our entire library, or you can rent, buy, and watch for free select resources. With over 700 hours of teaching to watch and more being added, we've got your needs covered.